Hi everyone, welcome to the corrections for the Math 92 pretest. My hope is that I'm going to walk through all of these questions and do corrections so that if you're having a little bit of trouble with these prerequisites skills, this is enough to sort of jog your memory or uh, put you in a position where you can come and ask questions and get caught up on this content before we get too far into the term. So let's get started on these corrections. The first question asks you to evaluate the following. So evaluate means tell us what the number value is for something like this. What we're asking you to do here is follow something we call the bed mass rules. And this is a set of ordered operations. So we've just going to jot down the acronym bed mass and then I'm going to talk through what that actually means. The B in bed mass is for brackets. So what we need to do are the things that are housed inside brackets first. So in this case, we see that we've got seven minus 10 sitting inside brackets to um, sort of take our first step in terms of simplifying or evaluating this expression. So when you're evaluating, if you don't deal with or um, sort of reevaluate a number, just rewrite it so you don't lose it. We're not touching that two yet, but we're working inside the brackets and we're taking seven minus 10. So a positive seven minus 10 puts us into the negatives. So we'd get a negative three inside those brackets now, but we still need to square it and we still need to evaluate the negative one to the power of three as well. So brackets are taken care of. We've taken care of what we could inside those brackets. The E in bed mass is for exponents. So what we want to do is tackle the parts of this expression that deal with exponents. So once again, I'm not going to touch that too. We're going to leave that out front. But the square that we see on the negative three is attached to that bracket. So what that means is in our minds, we have to take negative three multiplied by negative three again. So negative three squared will give us a positive and its value three times three is going to be nine. So that first part of our expression becomes now two times nine plus we need to evaluate negative one to the power of three be a little bit careful here this means negative one times negative one times negative one again so one times one times one we know is one but if you have three negative signs that's an odd number of negative signs it's going to be negative one overall so if we want to clean this up a little bit we can um, sort of rewrite that last little piece and say that this is two times nine. If you have a positive and a negative side by side like this, I'm just going to combine those signs and say we're really just subtracting one. From here, we have D and M in our bed mass rules, which stand for division and or multiplication. Now these can be done in order that you see things from left to right. So I actually see that we're multiplying two by nine first. There is no division in this case, but with division and multiplication, they're kind of the same rank. You do what you see in order from left to right. So two times nine is going to be the piece we tackle next. Two times nine is going to give us 18. We still need to subtract one, and that's the last piece of our bed mass rules. We have addition, and we have subtraction. And once again, these are the same ranks. So we would do addition and subtraction in the order that you see things from left to right. So 18 take away one is 17 as our final answer. Part B involves the same kinds of rules. So we're gonna start at the top and do anything we can inside those brackets. So I'm going to rewrite 98 divided by because I'm not touching that piece yet. Inside the brackets though, we have addition, we have multiplication, and we have a three to the power of two. So we actually have to work inside those brackets and evaluate that exponent piece first. So I'm going to rewrite four plus five. We're not touching that yet, but we're multiplying that value by three squared, which is really three times three. Three times three is going to be nine. So I'm just going to do one tiny step at a time here. If we continue working inside those brackets, I see an addition problem, and then I see multiplication, five times nine. So bed mass rules say we have to actually do the multiplication before we add. So that's the piece I'm going to do next. We've got 98 divided by four, and then we've got a positive five times nine. So we're going to add five times nine or 45.
in this case. We still haven't finished inside those brackets. We can combine the 4 plus the 45, so we're still working at those brackets or cleaning up those brackets. 4 times, or sorry, 4 plus 45 rather, is going to give us 49. Now we're ready to go ahead and divide. If I take 98 and I divide it by 49, the whole number answer that I get is just positive 2. The next question comes with a slightly different set of instructions. It says expand and collect like terms. So when we see the word expand, what that means is we really want you to get rid of all of the brackets. So in 2a, we have 3x minus 5 times x plus 3. We have a binomial times a binomial. And it's essentially what we need you to do is multiply all of these things together. We often use an acronym for this, and that acronym is FOIL. I'm going to show you what that means as we work through this problem. If you see two terms, so 3x minus 5 are two terms, multiplied by another set of two terms, or x plus 3, we can FOIL this out to remove those brackets. So the F in FOIL stands for FIRST. What that means is I'm going to take the first term in each set of brackets and multiply. So in this case, that's 3x times x. So 3x times x is going to give us a 3x squared. Now O in FOIL stands for outside or outer. So we're going to multiply 3x times 3. So 3x times 3, I always multiply the coefficients first. 3 times 3 gives us 9, and we still have x's here. That variable doesn't disappear. So we've done the first and outer terms. I stands for inner. So this negative 5 needs to be multiplied by both of the terms in those second sets of brackets. So I, or inner terms, are going to be negative 5 times x, or negative 5x. And last, but certainly not least, we have negative 5 times positive 3. So a negative times a positive is going to give us a negative, and 5 times 3, of course, is 15. So we've gotten rid of all the brackets. Now we have to look at our expression and see if anything can be combined as a like term. Now 3x squared doesn't have any friends. It's a lonely term with nothing we can combine or add to it. But we notice that 9x minus 5x, those are like terms because they have the same variables. So we take 9 of those x's and we subtract 5 of those x's. So 9 minus 5 is going to be positive 4, but again, they're still x's. The last term we have here is minus 15, and that's the constant term. It can't be combined with anything else. So when we say expand, what we're asking you to do is get rid of the brackets and collect like terms. Our next expansion problem also has brackets, and we want to get rid of the brackets up front here, but it's not a FOIL kind of problem because I don't have two binomials being multiplied. Essentially, what I'm going to need to do here is distribute the 3 through the set of brackets, or I'm going to multiply 3 through those brackets. So we're going to have 3 times n and then 3 times 4n squared. So let's work that out. 3 times n is just 3n. 3 times 4n squared is going to be 12 of those n squareds. Now I'm just going to rewrite the rest of the expression because we're not touching those terms yet. There's nothing for us to multiply. There's nothing for us to divide. We just want to rewrite the rest of the expression. From here, what we need to do are essentially clean up the mess that we made. We've got to collect any of the like terms that we see. If you put things in descending order of power, which is the norm, we're going to say that 12n squared has a buddy, and that's positive 3n squared. So if I combine those as like terms, 12 plus 3 gives us a total of 15 of those n squareds. Now I can observe that there's actually n terms that are like as well. So if I have 3n's and I take 10 away from that, 3 minus 10 is going to give us a negative 7, but again, those are still n's. The last term we have here is the constant term of minus 8, and it doesn't have anything to collect with or to join. So we'll just rewrite that as minus 8 as your last term. So what we've done is we've expanded because we've gotten rid of all of the brackets, and then we've collected like terms to clean up our mess a little bit and simplify this as much as possible. 
The next example we have here, question number three, says simplify using positive exponents. Now, negative exponents are okay, but they're not considered simplified form for the work that we're doing in this course. So essentially, this question requires us to understand some of our exponent rules. If you see a negative exponent, essentially what you want to do is you want to pack it up and move it. If you move it to its alternate position, so if you have a negative exponent in the numerator, and I'm going to highlight the term here that's causing problems, b to the power of negative 2 is valid, but it's not in its best position. So what we want to do is we want to pack up anything with a negative exponent attached to it and move it across that division line to make it positive. So um, essentially that b to the power of negative 2 is going to shift down into the denominator and become b squared. Everything else is happy. Everything else has a positive exponent. So for now, I'm just going to rewrite those terms. We'll have 3a to the 6th. We'll have c to the power of 4. And we're dividing that by 9a b to the sixth power, that's happy down there. b squared is going to join it because we're going to pack that up and move it across that division line. And c to the, to the ninth power, rather, is still there. So from here, we have a little bit more cleanup to do. If we look at those fractions out front, 3 divided by 9 is a fraction that we can reduce to lower terms. So I'm just going to move over to the left side here set up my division line and 3 divided by 9 is a fraction that reduces to 1 third. So we've taken care of those coefficients out front. Now what we recognize is that we have a to the sixth power in the numerator and we can cancel with the a in the denominator. So this is something we call the quotient rule. We know that that sneaky little a in the denominator is actually power of 1. So if I have six a's in the numerator and I have one a in the denominator, and I can imagine, I'm just going to do this over in the margin to show you what we're thinking. If I have six a's in the numerator and I spread them out and I have one a in the denominator, I can cancel that one a because they're common to both the numerator and denominator. What that means is these are my leftovers, and if I counted them up, I would have a to the fifth left over. That's sitting up in the numerator position, so I'm going to say we have a to the fifth if we cancel that single a out. So that's all done. We've dealt with those a terms. If we take a look at the b's, the bases of b that are in the denominator, we have b to the sixth times b squared. And remember, when you multiply bases that are the same, you add those powers together. If I spread out b to the sixth or write six b's side by side, I'd have multiplying that or I would be multiplying that by two b's side by side. If I counted them all up, we would have b to the power of six plus two or b to the power of eight. Now, in this last little bit, we've got c to the fourth divided by c to the ninth power. Once again, we're going to find the difference between four and nine, but you have to be careful about where you put that base of c in your final answer. So I'm just going to erase the work that we did for those a variables, and we're going to do the same thing for the c's. So if I spread out those c to the fourth and write it as four c's side by side, do the same thing in the denominator and write out all nine of them, what we want to be doing now is canceling four of them because they're common to both the numerator and denominator. So I can cancel four c's here, I can cancel four c's here, and if I circle what we have left, that's c to the fifth power, but it's sitting in the denominator because that's where our power was heavier. If we cancel four out, we still have five remaining, but it's sitting in the denominator of our fraction. So we have c to the fifth sitting in the denominator. So this is actually our final answer. You can have that one sitting out front as a coefficient if you like, or if you really wanted to, you could rewrite this as just a to the fifth because the assumption is the coefficient is a one, and then you'd have three b to the power of eight, c to the power of five. I can't combine any more of these bases together because they're all different, so these are versions of our final answer. 
Example number four comes with a different set of instructions. What we're asking you to do here is solve. When you see that word solve, it means we're trying to figure out what the variable is equal to. So in this case, because we're using y's, we want to know what y is equivalent to. What we have, though, are two sides of an equation, 18 minus 4y, but that right side is kind of jumbled up with some brackets. So what we want to do is try and peel away those brackets so that we can have access to all of the variables. So if we get rid of those brackets, we need to multiply 2 through everything behind it in that bracket. So 2 times y is going to be 2y. 2 times 1 is positive 2, so we've distributed that 2 through the bracket. From here, what we need to do are get the y's together and get the constants to the opposite side. So you can choose whether you move things to the left or to the right, but out of habit, I'm just going to move that y over to the left side. In order to do that, I need to subtract 2y from both sides because it's the opposite operation. So I will eventually have a negative 4y, and when 2y joins it, it's going to be minus 2y. At the same time, I want to push the constant to the opposite side, so just the number to the right side. So we already have a positive 2 on the right side. When 18 joins it, again, because we can imagine we're adding 18 to the left side, so to undo that relationship, we have to subtract 18 from both sides. So I'm just going to subtract 18 from both the left and right sides. Negative 4y minus 2y, those are like terms, so I'm going to combine them to make negative 6 of those y's. And 2 minus 18, those are just constants that we can combine. So 2 minus 18 is going to be a negative 16. What I want you to notice is there's only one equal sign per line, and it's right in the middle of our equation. Don't put an equal sign up front because then it, it becomes confusing. Then I don't know which is the left or the right side. It's actually improper notation. So we want to make sure that we've got one equal sign per line, and we've got one more step before we're actually solved for y. So at this stage, negative 6y means negative 6 times y. If we want to undo that relationship, we want to divide the left side by negative 6 so that we can isolate y. But with equations, we want to stay balanced. So whatever we do to the left side, you do to the right side as well. So those negative 6s on the left cancel, and we're left with y equals... And then on the right side, negative 16 divided by negative 6 is going to be a positive 16 over 6. But we can reduce that fraction. Both of those numbers are divisible by 2. We can divide them by 2 or cut them in half. So 16 divided by 2 is going to give us 8 in reduced form. 6 divided by 2 is going to give us 3. Please leave this as a fraction, even though it's improper, uh, because we don't want to convert to decimal numbers here. This fraction value is exact, and you can leave it as 8 over 3 or 8 divided by 3. Our solution is 8 thirds. The next example also asks us to solve, but this time we have a different type of equation. I can't get the x's all by themselves because what we see here is an x squared. This is something that's called a quadratic equation. Because it's also a trinomial, there are three terms to this. What we need to do first is factor. That's another skill we'll get into in a few moments in this correction video. But for now, we're going to have to factor this equation in order to solve it. So when you factor something, it's essentially the reverse of the FOIL process. We have to put this back into its two binomial factors so that we can solve or isolate those single x's. So if you have something called a simple trinomial, what that means is you have a single one up front. So we've got one x squared. Trinomial means three different terms. So we've got three terms that we have to try and somehow break down into factored form. So with these kinds of questions, I always start with first term first. In order to get an x squared in that first position, when I think about foiling, I need to multiply an x by an x. So all done there. The last positions need to multiply to give me a negative 18. So what I know for sure is that I have one sign of each type. So there's one positive 
and one negative because that's the only way I can multiply to get negative 18. Now, the middle term is the kicker here. We have to find two numbers that not only multiply to give us negative 18, but they have to add together to give us a positive 3. So if we think about factors of 18, there are quite a few sets here. The factors of 18 include 1 and 18, they include 2 times 9, or they include 3 times 6. Now, I'm not worried about the signs yet. I just want to see which pair of numbers is going to do the trick. 1 and 18 doesn't combine to give us a positive 3. If I added 1 and 18, I'd get 19. If I subtracted the 2, I'd get 17. So that one doesn't work. That's not a good option. 2 and 9 would combine to give us either 11 if we added them or a 7 if we subtracted them. So that's not going to work either. Last but not least, we have a 6 and a 3. If I combine 6 and 3 the right way, I'll come up with a positive 3. So really, if we think about adding 6 and subtracting 3, that should do the trick. So we've got a plus 6 and a minus 3. Again, I know the first term works for sure. x times x is x squared. 6 times negative 3 in the last positions give us negative 18. So that's right. So we've got our first term. We've got our last term. Those all look good. It's the middle term that sometimes is dicey. So I'm going to show you something I call the smiles check. If you do a baby smile, 6 times x is positive 6x. If we now do a big smile x times negative 3 is negative 3x. If I add those together, 6 take away 3 is positive 3 of those x's, which is exactly what I want in the middle term. So I know that I've factored this correctly. So in factored form, we have x plus 6 times x minus 3, and that's now equal to 0. But don't lose sight of this question. This question asked us to solve for x, so we need to tell everybody what x is equal to. Now that we have this in factored form, we have just simple linear factors. We're going to use something called the zero factor property. If you have an equation that's set to zero like this, what we're saying is that x plus 6 on its own could be zero because zero times anything is zero. We also know that x minus 3 on its own could be zero. So we actually have two different solutions that are possible. So if I take this first little mini equation and I solve it for x, it means I want x by itself, I need to move that plus 6 over to the right side. The only way for me to do that is to subtract 6 from both sides. So 0 minus 6 is going to be a negative 6, and that's one of our solutions. Same thing for our second little mini equation. If I want x by itself, I need to take that negative 3 and move it over to the right. In order to do that, I need to uh, sorry, add 3 to both sides. So 0 plus 3 is going to be positive 3. What that means is I have two solutions for this equation. Again, the instructions weren't just to factor, we had to solve. So once we're in factored form, we have to solve that resulting equation. In this case, our two, our two solutions are negative 6 and positive 3. Now our next example asks you to do something different. It says factor the following completely. So this requires multiple different types of techniques for factoring. So um, in previous courses, you would have higher modules where you learned how to factor or the different techniques that were appropriate. This is a review of a few of those methods. So the first thing I like to do is actually count my terms so I have my bearings a little bit. With 5a, I see that there are two terms. What I often look for are things that are common initially. So is there anything common between the number values or the coefficients up front? Is there anything common for the variables? And in this case, if we look closely at 3 and 21, we know that 3 is a common factor. We can divide both of these coefficients by 3. Aside from that, I also notice that n is a common factor because there's at least an n in each of those terms as variables. So when you're factoring... 
Your greatest common factor is going to sit out front if you're just taking out common factors. And then what I call your leftovers are going to sit inside those brackets. So in my mind now, because 3n is common, I want to divide that first term by 3n and I want to divide that second term by 3n as well. When we do that, 3n squared divided by n, the threes essentially divide themselves out or cancel n squared divided by n leaves us with just 1n. If I were to multiply through and double check, 3n times n would give us that 3n squared back, so I know I'm on the right track. Second term now, positive 21 divided by 3 is a positive 7. n divided by n essentially divides itself out or cancels, and we're left with just plus seven in that last position. Once again, factoring means we wanna put this in brackets and show how we would multiply those things together to get our original expression back. So we've now left this in factored form. There is nothing further that we can do. There are no common factors for us to remove. Part B is another factoring problem. So we want to take a look at 49y squared minus 25. If we count those terms, there are only two terms here, and nothing is common. I can't think of a number that we can divide both 49 and 25 by. So there's a different factoring technique that's required here. Some of you might remember something called a difference of squares. If you have a difference of squares, Difference means minus, so there's a big fat minus sign in the middle. Squares mean your numeric values or your variables are perfect squares. 49 is a perfect square, y squared is a perfect square, and so is the number 25. So when you have a difference of squares, the way you factor, if you recall, is to have two binomials, but these are what we call conjugates. You'll have one plus in the middle, and you'll have one minus in the middle. So let's go back to first term first. Two terms need to multiply to give us back that 49y squared. So the only way I can think of is 7y times another 7y. That'll give us 49y squared in that first position. To get 25, perfect factors of, um, sorry, 25 is a perfect square, so the numbers that we can think of here would be 5 times 5. So positive 5 times negative 5 would give us that negative 25 back. Now, some of you might be recalling the smiles check we did a few minutes ago. And let me show you what happens with the smiles check here. If I were to check my middle term, there is no middle term, but let's confirm that it actually disappears. Here's a baby smile. 5 times 7 would be positive 35 of those y's. But 7y times negative 5 would be negative 35 of those y's. If I tried to combine those, they actually cancel and give us no y's. That's why we end up with two terms when we expand what we call a set of conjugates. So 7y plus 5 and 7y minus 5 are conjugates. They're the exact same terms, but one of them is being added and the other is subtracted. So when we expand this, we can see that the middle term disappears each and every time. So the factored form for 49y squared minus 25 is just 7y plus 5 and 7y minus 5. We factored that expression completely. Part C gets us back to trinomials or three terms. Once again, if you have three terms, we're going to set up two sets of brackets because this is the reverse of that FOIL process. Start with first term first a times a is going to give us back that a squared. Skip the middle for a second and think about factors of 56. This is a lot harder. 28 times 2 is 56, oh boy. Or uh, 7 times 8. So 8 times 7 is 56, and I can actually think of ways to, to combine that 8 and 7 to get the 1 that we want in the middle. There's imaginary 1 coefficient in front of that a in the middle term. So once again, we're multiplying to get 56, but we're summing together or adding our terms to get the negative 1 we want in the middle. Now, 56 in the last position is a negative, so we know we have to have 1 plus and 1 minus. And in this case, 8 and 7 are the factors we want to use because we want to combine to get that one in the middle. So let's make sure that we have our signs right. Once again, I'm going to do that smiles check. 
7 times a, or positive 7 times a is 7a. a times negative 8 is a negative 8a. If I add those together, 7 take away 8 is a negative 1a, and that's exactly what I want in that middle term. So we know that we factored that simple trinomial correctly. Last but not least, we have 2x squared minus 11x plus 12. This one is more complicated because this is something we call a general trinomial. That 2x squared up front, the coefficient of 2, is going to wreak a little bit of havoc on our middle terms. So we still want to start with first term first. 2x times x is 2x squared. So that's all done. That was nice and easy. Skip the middle for a second and take a look at a 12. We need to think about factors of 12, but put them in such a way that when I combine them, my middle term turns out to be a negative 11. So what we want to make sure of is that we've got one positive and one negative. Now, the other problem is factors of 12 could be 1 times 12, we could have 2 times 6, or we could have 3 times 4. Traditionally, you want to start with a number pair that's closest together. So 3 and 4 are the numbers that are closest together. So that's the pair that I want to try initially here. So if we have 3 times 4, where we put those numbers is extremely important. So I'm going to put 4 in this set of brackets and 3 in this set of brackets. What I also recognize is that both of these terms need to be negative because we need to multiply to get a positive, but we need to combine them to get a negative overall. Let's do our smiles check and see what happens. So if I take a look at negative 4 times x, that's a negative 4x. If I take a look at 2 times negative 3, that's a negative 6 times x. If I add those numbers together, I get a negative 10. But that's a problem. Negative 10 is not the right middle term. We want to have negative 11. I don't want you to throw out the values. 3 and 4 might still work, but because we have that 2x squared up front, it might mess around with how your middle term gets calculated. So don't throw away that value of 4 and 3. Switch its position and see if that helps us. So I'm just going to erase my check here. And I'm going to switch the 2, or sorry, the 3 and the 4 rather. So we still have minus signs, but instead I'm going to put 4 on the outside and 3 on the inside. Now when we check your middle term, I'm still using 3 and 4, but I swap their positions. Negative 3 times x is negative 3x, and 2x times negative 4 is negative 8x. When I combine those values, negative 3 and negative 8, I get the negative 11 that I want. So we know that 3 and 4 were the right numbers, we just had to have them in the right set of brackets. So always do a little smiles check to check your middle term, but we've now landed on the correct factored form for 2x squared minus 11x plus 12. The next set of examples are all based on the graph or the picture that you see in front of you. So if we are given this graph, and it's the graph of something called a parabola, and we'll be talking about that in this course, the first thing I want you to be able to identify are the coordinates of what we call the x-intercepts. The x-intercepts are the locations where we cross the x-axis. So we know that the x-axis is always the horizontal one, and we know that the graph is crossing at two different locations. What you need to be careful of is how you write your answer here. So if I want a coordinate, it means I need a location. My first x-intercept, if we're going from left to right, is going to be at the location negative 6, comma 0. Because when x is negative 6, your y value is 0 at that point. The other intercept is going to be 1, 0. So when x is 1, your y value is 0. So that would be the proper way to state your coordinate. Unfortunately, sometimes I'll get a coordinate stated like this, negative 6, comma 1, rather. That's incorrect because that location would be here. 
I'm drawing it on the graph for you. And that's not where my intercept is. So you cannot write it as negative 6, 1 because that's not the intercept of a graph. The proper way to write your coordinates would be negative 6, 0 and 1, 0. So, so far, so good. Part B, on the other hand, is asking for the location of the y-intercept. So it's where the graph crosses the y-axis. I know that the y-axis is vertical, so if I can see and trace where that graph cuts through the y-axis, we know that that's happening right here on your grid. So that's crossing through when y is negative 2. But again, if we want a coordinate, we have to write this as a proper ordered pair. And x always goes first. So this time, when x is 0, my y value is negative 2. Part C in this asks you to state the domain of the function. Remember, domain means how far left does the graph reach to how far y the graph reaches. So uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping that you assume that these tails extended in those directions indefinitely. And if I could imagine this graph would sneak as far to the left as I could ever imagine, same thing for the right side. So the domain is actually going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. Or what we can do is write this as um, in a different type of notation, and we could say x is an element of the real numbers. Remember, domain is all about the x's. So in this case, we could say that x could be any real number in the whole wide world. So that's the domain of this function. The range of the function deals with the y value. So we're saying how low does the graph go to how high? We always have to go from low to high or left to right. Because this is range, we have to say low to high. If I mark my lowest point on the graph, that's happening here. Think about the y value at that location. The lowest y value I see is negative 4. So this graph is going to go as low as negative 4, and it includes that value, so I'm going to put a square bracket at that location. Now we have to figure out how high this graph goes, and you can see that the tails of the graph go upwards forever. So we know that the high point is going to essentially be positive infinity. So this graph goes from negative 4 to positive infinity. If we were to use set builder notation as well, we'd have to say y is greater than or equal to negative 4. So you might be formal and say y such that y has to be greater than or equal to negative 4, but it has to be a real number. So that's another type of notation that you might see in your book. But it's important for you to be able to identify the intercepts and then tell us what both the domain and range values are for graphs that look like this. Last but not least, we want you to graph and show us what 2x cubed plus 4x squared minus 2x looks like, or plus 1 rather, looks like um, if you were to graph this on your calculator or using your calculator. Sometimes finding higher powers is difficult, so I just want to remind you that there's something called a caret key. It looks like a little hat or a little roof. That means raised to the power of. So when you're typing this equation into your calculator, you might type it in as y equals 2x, and then you're going to use your caret key and say power of 3. So 2x to the power of 3 plus 4x, and you can just use your square key, or you can say power of 2. And then you have to be careful that you're subtracting 2x. So you have to use the minus sign, not the negative symbol that's beside your decimal. After that, you've got a little plus 1. So what I want to do is just give you a quick snapshot of my calculator screen and show you what this graph should look like. So you want to make sure when you're graphing, you've got this in your y equals or under your y equals key. So we've got y equals 2x to the power of 3 plus 4x squared minus 2x plus 1. So you can see how this has been typed in. Next, I'm going to show you when you hit that graph key, what your graph should look like when it's in a standard window. So the sketch that I 
C uh, in your final answer should look something like this. We know that the graph in a standard window is starting at negative 10 and ending at positive 10. So we're going from negative to positive 10. Uh, when you make your sketch, you can see that one of my x-intercepts is somewhere around let's say negative two and a bit, we can find those spots on your calculator, but that's not important for this exercise. We also can see that there's a y-intercept and that the graph never really crosses that x-axis again. So again, we're knowing uh, the scale in a standard window goes from negative 10 to the far left to positive 10 on the far right. We also know for the y values, we go from negative 10 at the bottom to positive 10 at the top. So that helps give you an idea of how to recreate this sketch in your own grid space or on your own grid. So that's the end of the corrections for these exercises on your pretest. If you do have further questions or need some extra support, please don't be shy and reach out Come and see me and we can make sure that these skills are up to speed before we get too far into the course.